All right, our first scripture reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and saw their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his kinsfolk. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, he saw two Hebrews fighting, and he said to the one who was in the wrong, why do you strike your fellow Hebrew? He answered, who made you a ruler and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled Pharaoh. He settled in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jezebites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh to bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. The word of God for the people of God. Well, good morning once again. It's good to be with you. I'm glad that you wanted me to come back. Didn't put any, <laughs> didn't put any um, barricades out in the driveway. So it's just really good to be here again. And I am grateful for the change in um, temperature that we're experiencing these last few days. Well, it was almost 20 years ago that Ann Arbor first um, underwent a series of renovations one phase that included our sanctuary. We were finally going to come into the 20th century and have an elevator put into our church building. But this phase included the transformation of the altar and the pulpit areas, a ramp access to the um, altar level from the sanctuary floor that had never been there before. There were always steps. A ramp access to the choir loft level. We had one individual who, though she was in her um, cart, her motorized cart, she was now able to stand with the choir on that level and be part. So all this was important in terms of our church moving forward. It included upholstering the pews, new lighting, removal of pews to accommodate this larger um, platform area that we have in our um, sanctuary now. But for that summer, I can't remember all of the details that it took to get everything together, but we, we worshipped under a tent the entire summer. We, in the fall, when it grew colder, 
We even had to move into the Michigan Theater nearby, a block away as the crow flies. Um, the title of the sermon series that summer was called Traveling in Tents. It was a title that was alliterative, but also descriptive of our congregation's experience at the time, and a nod to the nomadic lives of our Israelite ancestors. Last summer, we again met under a tent when we finally resumed after a year plus of in-person worship of isolation due to COVID. Recorded video services are just not the same as that communal gathering in worship and praise. Both experiences in the tent 20 years ago and last summer were joyful just to be together in a new and different adventure. But tent worship also raises plenty of logistical planning problems, chairs, mics, power supply, instruments. What do we do in the event of rain and how do we get the word out? It was a steep learning curve for us, for we were literally filling the tent with people and necessary items and furniture every week as we gathered. It gives me a better appreciation of 40 years of nomadic living, wandering in the wilderness and in a desert, packing up the family belongings, the animals, and a tabernacle each time the pillar of fire moved our ancestors onward. So last week we looked to the story of Elijah seeking shelter and food with the widow of Zarephath. And this week, we're going to examine the life of Moses, called upon to lead the Israelites on the journey out of Egypt, the Exodus. Now, long before Elijah ever crisscrossed the land of Israel, Moses, too, traveled in many directions. And it calls to mind, as I was reading your bulletin this morning, and it said, our congregation is on a lifelong journey of discipleship to become more like Christ. How are we like Moses indeed? Journeys. They were a significant portion of Moses' life as well. His life began in Egypt. He had been born to a Hebrew family, but we all remember the story of him being placed in the basket and sent out into the waters where he was given into the care, thank goodness, of the Pharaoh's daughter. His first voyage, was on in that basket was to a very a life very different from what his family and those of his people experienced. How privileged he was to live in the house of Pharaoh. Now most of us probably think mostly of, of Moses living in the desert, leading, conjoling, reprimanding, delivering the word of God to his people, receiving the Ten Commandments following a pillar of fire by night, a cloud of smoke by day, until after 40 years it took to see his reward, arriving in eyesight of the land of milk and honey. What patience that man had. But in between those verses in the chapters 2 and 3 of Exodus, we get some insight into the man that Moses was, not just the strong leader who led through the desert. Moses was not always the strong and confident one. Wasn't always that strong person who came down from the mountainside, his face shining with the glory of God, reminding the, it, the Israelites to stop their endless doubt, complaining, and wayward behavior. Oh no. Moses had doubts and fears of his own. Remember those words of Moses in his first negotiation with God? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? I know that imposter syndrome all too well, that sense of unworthiness, an obstacle in front of us that seems insurmountable. But look, they may not believe me or listen to me, but say, the Lord didn't appear to you. Can you hear Moses' lack of confidence 
And I'm sure in that moment, he was remembering the incident when the Hebrew fighters questioned him, who made you judge and rule over us? The sense of inadequacy once again keeps Moses from responding to God's call. Oh Lord, I have never been eloquent. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And finally, as a very human being, Moses begs, oh my Lord, please send someone else. There must be someone, anyone, who can do it better than I. But eventually, Moses agrees to go. With the assistance of Aaron's voice, a staff, and most of all with God's assurance that I will be with you. Sometimes, though, we forget about those intervening years when Moses is still living in Egypt, biologically Hebrew, but a member of Pharaoh's family. Moses, a young adult, lays witness to one human being in the throes of beating another. He recognizes the victim of one of his tribe, one of his Hebrew people. And in one verse, one verse only, we hear that Moses kills an Egyptian and hides the body in the sand. That's all we are given. The next day, he sees another altercation between two of his fellow Hebrews, and when he attempts to stop that fighting, they question his authority. I'm sure that this fueled Moses' doubt about his leadership capabilities. They let Moses know that they knew he had killed the Egyptian. And Moses is frightened. Now, I was an adult when the significance of this story crystallized in my head. Moses had killed a man. That was not who I thought him to be when I think of coming down off of the mountaintop with the tablets of the Ten Commandments. Was he afraid of the consequences of killing an Egyptian? Or simply ashamed of his actions? Was there any other solution that he could have reached for? I don't recall or reading this as a child. Was it not in the Sunday school issues, lessons of my childhood? Or do we just sometimes avoid what we can't come up with an answer for and pay less attention to it, just as the seeming lack of words in the Bible seem to do? But this is when Moses flees to Midian, across the Arabian Peninsula, that same peninsula and desert where he will lead the Israelites home to Canaan. He meets the daughters of a priest, comes to their aid once again against shepherds who are blocking access to water. And once again, Moses intercedes on behalf of an oppressed person. He marries one of those daughters, settles down in the land, and tends the flock from Pharaoh's household to a shepherd. Quite a journey. And then one day, God comes calling. He has heard the cries of his people under slavery, and he chooses Moses as his instrument to achieve their freedom. Moses will need convincing and ultimately cannot resist the voice and vision coming from the burning bush. It's quite a negotiation when you read the entire chapter and the back and forth between Moses and his God. Moses, who says he's slow of tongue, slow of speech, seems quite adept at expressing himself with God when he's not quite sure he can do what he's being asked to. We remember Moses leading his people. Moses relaying the word of God to the Israelites. Moses breaking the stone tablets when faced with his people's rebelliousness. It's this fully formed Moses that we see in our mind's eye. But this scripture passage today 
reminds us of an infant boy, a child that's raised in privilege, a man who flees, flees when he's faced with his own wrongdoing, who crumples in the face of criticism leveled by his Israelite peers, an adult afraid to speak in front of others, a human being reluctant to serve when God calls. It is the transformation that God works in Moses that holds so much hope for me and I hope for you. For despite Moses' flaws, God calls him to be a leader of his people, to negotiate their freedom, to persevere under harsh conditions of hunger and thirst, to guide his people 40 years in the wilderness when they're hungry and thirsty, giving order and structure to those Israelites despite their complaining and resistance to living in community with respect and dignity for one another. If God can take a scared and troubled young man and create Moses the leader in the wilderness, can you imagine what God can do with each of us? This is the God who created day and night, land and sea, moon and stars, all earthly creatures, mountains, waterfalls, majestic soaring redwoods, and tiny hummingbird wings. We are all works in progress. We have flaws, but God is continually molding, shaping, instructing us in order to be less reluctant and more faithful. We cannot ignore our faults and our weaknesses and our decisions that are poor. The love that we share with others, our decisions and life choices that lack kindness or compassion. And we cannot eventually avoid responding to God's call on our lives. Fast forward this two millennia since Moses, many more journeys many different players, you and I, our congregations, our communities, God is calling each of us to use our gifts and graces to further the kingdom here on earth. Even when we feel unworthy, unprepared, embarrassed, or even guilty. God calls us to serve just as Moses was called. Let's pray. O oh, loving and transforming God, keep us listening for your call. Ready our hearts and minds to see a burning bush. Transform us like Moses into the people you would have us be. Remove complaints and grumbling from our vocabulary. Let our response be actions and words hands and feet in service, with hearts of love, and spirits filled with the grace of Jesus Christ for one another. Amen. Enjoy some fellowship and the movie The Chosen in the sanctuary on Wednesday evenings in August, except August 17th, from 6 to 8.30 p.m., Hosted by Jill Sestock and Susan Featheringill, this experience will help us dig deeper into the Word of God. Simply show up and bring your favorite movie-going treat. Saturday, September 10th will be the last of two Myers Simply Give Double Days. If we can raise $5,000 between the two double days, Meyer will match with $10,000 for a total of $15,000. Please give in this way to fortify the food closet ministry. We are looking for some helpers to help fund and assemble kiddo worship bag kits. This project will take place during August and can be done at home or at church. 
Our goal is to put together worship bags to help children and youth engage in worship at their level. Contact Jill Sestock or the church office for all the specifics. Shelter Scarcity, formerly known as the Homeless Ministry, is in need of volunteers. If you have a passion for this ministry or just want to help, see Mike Skelton at the table in the narthex after worship. At the next parking lot service on August 28th, we will have a praise and hymn sing. In order to create the service, we need your help. On the table in the lobby of the worship space is a paper to tell us your favorite hymn or praise song or two. Take some time today to contribute to the praise and hymn sing service. If you have information you want included in Sunday Snippets, be sure to share it with the church office by noon on Tuesday. Thank you.